This is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You exactly. say things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you said. And if we deliver what we say we're going to deliver. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. In this podcast series, How Did We Get Here?, I try to provide context and background to a big story in the news by talking to someone with real insight. In this edition, we're going back to where it all started. In the first week of February 2020, I spoke to Dr Natalie McDermott about this strange new coronavirus, which was just beginning to cause alarm. Back then, it hadn't even been given an official name. 16 months later, I've gone back to talk to Dr McDermott, a clinical lecturer at King's College London, about what we've been through and about what we can expect. And she has her own story. She caught COVID at the beginning of last year and she has not fully recovered. This was recorded on the 22nd of July before the recent run of days of falling cases. So Natalie McDermott, I mean, um, we spoke in February 2020. Did you think 16 months later, or here we are 16 months later, did you ever imagine that we'd be still talking in this way about this pandemic? Um, I think I probably hoped we wouldn't, uh, but I think I uh, didn't anticipate that this was something that would necessarily uh, come under control particularly quickly. Um, I think I certainly would have hoped that um, once a vaccine was available, uh, we might not be having to talk about case numbers and, and so on in the way that we are um, still. But uh, yeah, I mean, I guess... I guess I thought it had the potential to spread worldwide, but knowing if it actually would or whether sort of standard disease containment measures would be sufficient uh, was difficult to, to know at that time. But certainly I, I had a bad feeling about it. <laughs> you had a bad feeling. I remember us talking about uh, disease X, uh, which was something I wasn't familiar with um, as a sort of WHO sort of concern about something that could, could, could be on this sort of scale. I mean, is that what it just explain disease X again for us? And, and has, has this turned out to be that? Yeah, so um, disease X is basically um, the, the unknown pathogen that has the potential to cause uh, a worldwide pandemic. Um, so uh, it's been on the radar for a long time with the WHO and infectious disease experts of trying to work out what uh, what the next pathogen might be or what measures might need to be in place for a pathogen that that can spread uh, throughout the world and uh, wreak havoc. Um, so yes, I guess essentially SARS-CoV-2 is, is disease X. Uh, I mean, it, it has some similarities obviously to its closest uh, neighbor, which is the SARS virus that was spreading around 2002, 2003 time, uh, but also has a lot of differences. So uh, yeah, it would fall into that category of disease X. When we spoke in February 2020, um, you know, you got a, a lot of, dare I say, you got a lot of stuff right about what we might expect. Has there been anything that has surprised you uh, in what we've learned in the last 16 months about um, COVID-19? Um, I think uh, its propensity to cause multi-organ disease probably uh, is what has maybe surprised me the most. I think we were anticipating more of a respiratory um, virus picture, which, which it, it is in the sense of how it spreads. Uh, but its propensity to kind of trigger uh, a very extreme inflammatory response in people. And then also this resultant uh, problems with long COVID that um, we're now learning about. Uh, I probably wouldn't have anticipated it on the level that it is. Uh, I mean, with any virus, you you do get people who are more severely affected and you get some post-viral sequelae afterwards in, in a certain proportion of the population. But uh, the, the numbers that it's affecting um, uh, are, are very high. Well, we'll come back to talk about that. Um, I just want to also talk about sort of UK government response. Um, can I ask you, how would you rate that UK government response so far over 16 months? Um, I think my, my opinion sort of waxes and wanes a little bit um, in the sense that I think generally speaking, I have felt the response to be overall positive. Uh, I think there's certainly areas that we could have acted a lot quicker and uh, areas for improvement. But I think there's a lot of things we've done quite well as well in terms of 
funding research, funding research into the vaccine, um, communications. Uh, you know, I know there's been criticism about how the government sometimes has communicated, but there have been regular communications from the government uh, up until fairly recently that were uh, relatively consistent uh, in terms of the messaging that they were trying to convey. So I, I think we've done those things well, but I think we could have certainly acted quicker. Uh, and I have a lot of reservations about recent decisions that have been made uh, in light of uh, relaxing all, all containment measures. Well, let me ask you a bit more about that. I mean, we're going into a situation now where, um, as you say, in England, all the legal restrictions basically have, have come off at a time when everybody acknowledges that cases are going to rise. Uh, I f feel like that is not such a good idea. Um, I think that there's things that we can do uh, that uh, enable a bit more stability of the economy uh, without uh, relaxing all measures that are going to enable this virus to run rampant. And I mean, even with some measures in place, we were seeing fairly rapidly escalating numbers of cases. Uh, and while I appreciate the government says, if we don't do it now, when will we do it? Uh, my argument would be we do it when uh, we have offered every single person in the country the opportunity of two vaccines and we've had a good uptake and we're seeing case numbers either fall or at least plateau. Uh, you know, at the point where you've got rising case numbers, you relax measures, it, it's going to it's going to explode, even in the context of vaccination, because we know that while the, the vaccine certainly protects people from severe illness and hospitalisation, uh, and it does certainly present, uh, prevent a number of infections, uh, it is still possible for people to become infected. And there are still some people who go on to experience quite a severe illness, despite having had uh, two vaccines. So I think that we're basically setting ourselves up for a problem for the winter, because we're putting ourselves on the back foot when we enter the autumn. So if we have, even at, at conservative numbers of the government's estimates, if we have 100,000 cases a day, uh, as we enter the autumn and winter period where people will be indoors more, schools will be restarting, and we'll be coming into the season of other respiratory viruses, we run the risk of overwhelming the NHS well before uh, it would have normally been overwhelmed in the winter. Uh, in fact, we're running the risk of overwhelming it fairly soon uh, with n numbers of hospitalizations rising um, in accordance with um, case numbers. Uh, and I think what we also don't know is while um, the hope is that uh, with the vaccine, COVID causes, if you can, if you are infected, COVID causes relatively mild illness, um, we don't know the implications in terms of long-term problems following that. We also don't know the implications if you're co-infected with another re winter respiratory virus. So what happens if you're infected with flu at the same time as having a, a mild degree of COVID? What happens then? Even with respiratory syncytial virus, which is a sort of a common cold virus for most adults, but for young infants causes a lot of problems. In Brazil, they were seeing a lot of children admitted to hospital with co-infections of respiratory syncytial virus and COVID, uh, much more so than they saw in the first wave of just COVID. So I think we need to we need to bear that in mind as well. And um, yeah. There's a lot that's worrying you there, clearly. We'll, we'll come back and try and unpack some of it. But I mean, you talked about we should wait until the point when basically everyone has been offered, uh, I think you said full vaccination. I mean, how long is that like into September? Roughly when do you think that could be? Yeah, I think that that's what the concern of the government is, that the point at which all adults will have uh, potentially uh, been offered both vaccines, it's, uh, it is sort of the end of August, uh, September time. I think they anticipate that. Um, and obviously their concern then is if they were to release measures then, um, you know, we'd be going into the winter months and therefore we'd have a problem. Um, I guess my view on that is then if that's the case, then we wait till next spring to, to fully release measures. You know, I think that the stage we'd got to facilitated people having enough freedoms in terms of seeing family members, in terms of gathering uh, that were that were sufficient to keep people happy, essentially, uh, and to rebalance some of the concerns uh, and fears that people had during the pandemic. Um, I don't think that the most recent measures 
make much difference to to the individual person in the UK. They probably make a difference to the economy to some degree, um, but uh, we have to offset that with the the risk that we end up in a in a full lockdown situation again in the winter. Uh, and so I'm not sure that the most recent measures were 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 necessary. Um, just one more on the measures, uh, which is people are talking about a lot, which is the uh, NHS COVID app, which can ping you. Um, a lot of people saying in terms of um, damage to the economy, that is now doing a lot of damage because people are being unnecessarily pinged. The government, having talked about potentially tweaking it, now seems to be digging in its heels and saying, no, this is useful and we should stick to it. Where do you stand on that? Um, I think that we should stick to it. Uh, because I think it really is important that people self-isolate if they've had contact with a confirmed case. We know that this virus is highly infectious. I think where there could be scope for negotiation there is perhaps uh, if people are fully fully vaccinated, they could possibly do a daily self-test um, instead of having to isolate. And if that test is, is negative, then uh, that I think is a it's not foolproof, but it is a way of perhaps mitigating uh, some of the risk whilst also balancing uh, people's need to, to be at work and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the hospitality industry, the NHS and so on not being without its staff. Now, you're obviously very concerned about where we could be heading. I'll just put to you, I mean, the government argument, as well as the idea being, if not now, when, is essentially, yes, we'll have lots of cases, but we don't think we're going to have lots of hospital hospitalizations and we don't think people are going to get seriously ill uh you're not convinced about all of that i i'm not convinced about all of that entirely i think certainly we are definitely seeing less hospitalizations i mean vastly less than we saw in previous waves and people who are becoming infected are less sick so there's less intensive care admissions i think that we can be sure of but I, I think it's what it's when you look at the percentages and i'm just going to use hypothetical percentages here uh, not not true ones but say that in the in the first wave 10 percent of people were uh, hospitalized with covid19 um and in this wave it's only one percent well that's fine but then our hundred thousand cases a day in this wave is similar to our ten thousand cases a day in the first wave so because there'll be so many more people getting sick Yes. Yeah. So and and what we are seeing is that quite a lot more young people are being admitted to hospital. Now, whether that's just because uh, they um, haven't been able to access two doses of the vaccine yet. Uh, but, you know, we weren't seeing that many young people as significantly ill in the first couple of waves. So I guess there's some some questions around that as well. Let me talk about um, or let us talk about your situation, because you caught COVID and you are still living with it, if I can put it like that. Can you just um, say ha what happened to you when you caught it and where you are now with it? Yes, yeah, so I think I caught COVID uh, probably at the end of March 2020 um, uh, through a colleague at work. And then uh, I was unwell for about 10 days at home. I had all of the symptoms, but I recovered and I was back at work um, within a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, back working on the wards. Uh, and then at the end of May time, uh, I was working on a COVID ward and um, I developed exactly the same symptoms almost uh, again as I had had in March, maybe slightly milder, but uh, pretty much identical. Um, and during that illness, I uh, developed uh, nerve pain in my feet. Um, and after a couple of weeks, all of the other symptoms went away, but the nerve pain in my feet continued. Uh, and then I realized I'd lost sensation in the soles of my feet and that my legs just weren't quite as strong as they were, uh, which at the time I thought, well, I've been unwell. I just need to build myself up again. But I go for daily walks and uh, I wasn't getting anywhere. Like there was no improvement in how far I could walk or how much I could do. Um, so uh, I had some investigations uh, uh, under a neurologist and um, I think as essentially it looks like there's been some kind of damage to my spinal cord. Um, and over the last year, there seems to have been, uh, well, at least from my perspective, a sort of a progression of symptoms, whether that's just from the initial insult or whether it's 
progressing uh, i don't know but a progression of sort of gradual loss of different uh, neurological functions uh, and so now i walk with crutches um uh, because i can't walk really more than a couple of hundred meters without them uh, and uh, i have problems with my bladder and my bowel and and, and things like that so this has actually really affected you seriously um even though initially for instance you weren't hospitalized with your when you had the original covid uh, yes, yeah, no, I wasn't hospitalised. I had probably what would be considered a relatively mi mild version. I mean, I was I was quite unwell at home, but I, I certainly didn't need to go to hospital. I mean, the reason I put it like that is, I mean, obviously, it's you know really, really sorry to, to to hear that and how it's still affecting you. But when we're talking about, oh well, lots of people are getting the illness, but don't worry, they won't end up in hospital. Presumably, you draw on your own experience and think, hmm, it's not quite that straightforward. Uh, yeah, uh, entirely. Uh, I think, you know, y y even young people are at risk of, of uh, problems following COVID. Um, you know, the, the risk seems sort of, uh, well, it does seem higher in people who've been hospitalised and had and, and been in intensive care. But some of that is coupled with problems following having been in intensive care rather than necessarily direct effects of the virus itself. Um, <clears throat> but certainly young people uh, can get problems following COVID, they can get long COVID. Uh, it can be very severe and life limiting, uh, at least in terms of their function, and it can last for quite a long time. Now, most people are recovering from it, but some people are still ill uh, at over a year. Uh, and it has the potential to cause a significant damage to our economy, not just to people's lives and livelihoods, but to our economy by people being uh, sick of work for, for a year or more. Can I ask, what's the prognosis for you right now, Natalie? Um, I, I think we don't really know. I think we don't know, will I make a full recovery? Is this the way it's going to be, but it's not going to get any worse? I, I think it's just, um, yeah, I think we don't know. Um, for for some people, they uh, people that I know, they do seem to make a gradual recovery, but they don't have quite the same uh, level of neurological symptoms that I have. So, uh, you know, most people with long COVID do seem to improve, but um, yeah. But it obviously can be, can, be, can be serious. I mean, do you think government um, the scientists advising government are taking that aspect of, of uh, this seriously enough when they contemplate, you know, 100,000 cases a day, for instance, and essentially say we're prepared to get to that level. Do you feel they're taking that, what's, you know, the sort of thing that's happened to you seriously enough? Um, no, I don't actually, because most of the time when the figures are quoted at, and the reasons for decisions are, are made, uh, the, they are always looking at... Um, hospitalizations and deaths and whether the NHS will be overwhelmed with the acute cases. Uh, and they don't really, they comment on long COVID, but they comment on it when asked by uh, journalists or, or something and they say, oh yes, we are concerned about long COVID, but it's not factoring into their decision-making in terms of figures. And you know, when you, when you look at it, if we're at 100,000 new cases a day, if we just take a conservative number really for, from the ONS of what uh, proportion of people might get long COVID from that. If we just look at say 10%, we're looking at 10,000 people a day who might be unwell for up to 12 weeks and many of them beyond 12 weeks as well. Um, that is an awful lot of people in our young to middle aged adult population who are our working population. Um, and I don't think we're factoring in the NHS being overwhelmed from an outpatient perspective. We always talk about inpatients and beds, but how are we going to optimally see all of those patients and manage them to try and help them recover and get back to work and get back to enjoying their daily lives as they have previously? How, how do we do that with 10,000 new cases a day? And if we hit 200,000 cases, which is, is, is being suggested at times by, uh, you know, the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer, if we hit that, we're talking 20,000 cases of long COVID a day. It's just enormous. And I don't think that's being adequately factored in. And I'm not entirely convinced it was adequately factored into the, the JCPI decision recently on whether we should vaccinate our teenagers and young people because they can also be affected by long COVID. Well, you, you raise vaccination, which is going to be my next question. I mean, vaccination is obviously a massive part of what we hope is the answer and, and does seem to be having an, a, 
an, an effect, um, and a significant impact. Presumably, you would say, everybody who's not vaccinated, get out and get fully vaccinated now. Absolutely, absolutely. The vaccine is our best chance of returning to uh, a normal uh, a normal-ish life. There may still be restrictions in place, but it is the best way for us to return and, and to, to make that as feasible as possible. We need as many people vaccinated as possible. I've had both vaccines. Uh, we know that the vaccine is is very safe. Uh, yes, there's a very small proportion of people that might have an adverse effect to it, uh, but that is the situation you discover with any vaccine when you're you're trying to immunise the entire population of the world. Mm. So, yeah, just to make it clear, you caught COVID before the vaccine had even been developed, hadn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was not. Yeah, just you. You didn't catch it after you'd been vaccinated, and you, you you've been vaccinated since. I mean. Going back to when we spoke in February 2020, we talked about the vaccines and at the time you said it would take months. I mean, it, it, it did take months, but did, were you, a lot, of, a lot of people were feeling there was no way we'd even have a vaccine by the end of 2020. Were you a little bit more optimistic at that point? Um, yeah, I was hopeful that we'd have one by the end of the year, but that's uh, in part because I knew that uh, there were already some tried and tested vaccine uh, platforms out there that really just needed to be modified uh, to uh, focus on the elements of, 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 of the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, that we needed to get our body's immune cells to recognise. Uh, so I say just, I mean, it, obviously it's a very complex process doing that, but still I had hopes uh, that it would be possible, and especially with the amount of funding that was put into the vaccine um, and the willingness of people to take part in vaccine trials, which was phenomenal as well. Uh, yeah, I, had, I did, did have high hopes that we uh, we would get uh, through through the clinical trials that were needed by, by the end of the year. Yeah. And they did. And it's obviously made a, a huge difference, although obviously there's still some, some vaccine hesitant people. And, they, and, it's, and the, there's large chunks of the world that still can't get nearly enough vaccine. You, is that something that you're looking at and you're concerned about as well, that even if you know, we can get to a point in this country, there's still going to be huge reservoirs of unvaccinated people where this can circulate, which will continue to be a problem? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, as the WHO have said, um, we're not safe till everybody's safe. You know, no one's safe till everybody's safe. Um, and the reality is we may be an island, but we are very interconnected with our world now. Um, and, uh, you know, if we haven't had uh, the vast majority of the world immunized, we run the risk that new variants appear, variants that might be uh, less affected by the vaccine and therefore can uh, can uh, infect people and cause significant illness. Um, anywhere you've got a virus running rampant, and it's another concern about of mine about allowing the virus to spread right now in the UK, anytime that happens, you just increase the chances of a variant appearing. Um, and Yes, that might not be a variant that that is a problematic one, uh, but obviously you don't you don't want to even give the opportunity for variants to appear in the event that one one is, and and invariably the variant that will persist is the one that can spread the, the easiest and that can evade the vaccine because then it can spread easier. Um, so um, I think. Uh, we just need to be cautious about that in this country, but we also need to be cautious about that in the rest of the world. And uh, there's uh, countries that have previously not been too badly affected, uh, you know, particularly in the in Africa, that are now experiencing enormous numbers of cases a day uh, in low resource settings where they don't have oxygen, they don't have ventilators, um, and you know the the burden is going to be enormous on those countries as well. All right, Natalie. We're coming to the end now. I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions. I mean, first of all, um, in this country, can I be cheeky and ask you, what do you think are the chances we may have to go back into something that would look like a lockdown? What percentage? I think uh, pretty high uh, looking at the winter. Um, now, whether that's a full lockdown uh, like we've been in before or whether it's sort of just a step back from some of the freedoms we've been given recently uh, is difficult to say but I, I think that coming into the winter uh, and the even the autumn uh, we could be facing certainly a reintroduction of restrictions. Okay all right and the second question do you think we're going to be talking about this in the middle of next year is it still going to be a fact of life for us? 
yes, but I hope that it will be more on the back seat than on the front seat, if you see what I mean. So it won't be right at the forefront of all reporting. It will be uh, more somewhere to somewhere to the back. But that's my hope. Uh, I, I can't say I feel confident that that will be the case, but that would be my hope. Well, Natalie McDermott, thanks very much for talking to us. And I hope you don't take this in the wrong way, but I hope not to be talking to you about COVID-19 in another uh, 16 months. Um, and also all the very, very best to you. If you have thoughts on this or ideas for other podcasts, you can email me at andy.bell at itn.co.uk. And I'm tweeting at at andybell 5 news And please share, rate and review. Thank you for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another along soon.